Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you can become a member of the YouTube channel and or become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 9. Flight, the White Stag The companions stumbled through the thick woods as fast as they could and soon reached the game trail. Caraman took the lead, sword in hand, eyeing every shadow. His brother followed, one hand on Caraman's shoulder, his lips set in grim determination. The rest came after, their weapons drawn. But they saw no more of the creatures. Why aren't they chasing us, Flint asked after they had traveled about an hour. Tannis scratched his beard. He had been wondering about the same thing. They don't need to, he said finally. We're trapped. They had undoubtedly blocked all the exits from this forest, with the exception of Darken Wood. Darken Wood, Goldmoon repeated softly. Is it truly necessary to go that way? It may not be, Tannis said. We'll go to look around from Prayer's Eye Peak. Suddenly they heard Caraman walking ahead of them, shout. Running forward, Tannis found Raceland had collapsed. I'll be all right, the mage whispered, but I must rest. We can all use rest, Tannis said. No one answered. All sank down warily, catching their breath in quick, sharp gasps. Sturm closed his eyes and leaned against a moss-covered rock. His face was a ghastly shade of grayish-white. Blood had matted his long mustaches and caked his hair. The wound was a jagged slash, turning slowly purple. Tannis knew that the knight would die before he said a word of complaint. Don't worry, Sturm said harshly. Just give me a moment's peace. Tennis gripped the knight's hand briefly, then went to sit beside Riverwind. Neither spoke for long minutes, then Tennis asked, You've fought these creatures before, haven't you? In the broken city, Riverwind shuddered. It all came back to me when I looked inside the cart and saw that thing leering at me. At least, he paused, shook his head. Then he gave Tennis a half smile. At least I know now that I'm not going insane. Those horrible creatures really do exist. I had wondered sometimes. I can imagine, Tannis murmured. So these creatures are spreading all over Kryn, unless your broken city was near here. No, I came into Kyushu out of the east. It was far from Solace, beyond the plains of my homeland. What do you suppose these creatures meant saying they had tracked you to our village? Goldmoon asked slowly, laying her cheek on his leather tunic sleeve, slipping her hand around his arm. Don't worry, Riverwind said, taking her hand in his. The warriors there would deal with them. Riverwind, do you remember what you were going to say, she prompted. Yes, you are right, Riverwind replied, stroking her silver-gold hair. He looked at Tannis and smiled. For an instant, the expressionless mask was gone, and Tannis saw warmth deep within the man's brown eyes. I give, you my, I give my thanks to you, half-elven, and to all of you. His glance flickered over everyone. You have saved our lives more than once, and I have been ungrateful, but... He paused. It's all so strange. It's going to get stranger. Raceland's voice was ominous. The companions were drawing near Prayer I... Prayer's Eye Peak. They had been able to see it from the road, rising above the forest. Its split peak looked like two hands pressed together in prayer, thus the name. The rain had stopped. The woods were deathly quiet. The companions began to think that the forest animals and birds had vanished from the land, leaving an eerie, empty silence behind. All of them felt uneasy except perhaps Tasselhoff, and kept peering over their shoulders or drawing their swords at shadows. Sturm insisted on walking near guard, but he began lagging behind as the pain in his head increased. He was becoming dizzy and nauseated. Soon he lost all conception of where he was and what he was doing. He knew only that he must keep walking, placing one foot in front of the other, moving forward like one of Taz's automatons. How did Taz's story go? 
Sturm tried to remember it through a haze of pain. These automatons served a wizard who had summoned a demon to carry the kinder away. It was nonsense, like all the kinder stories. Sturm put one foot in front of the other. Nonsense. Like the old man's stories, the old man in the inn. Stories of the white stag and ancient gods. Paladines. Stories of Huma. Sturm clasped his hands on his throbbing temples as if he could hold his splitting head together. Huma. As a boy, Sturm had fed on stories of Huma. His mother, daughter of a knight of Salamnia, married to a knight, had known no other stories to tell her son. Sturm's thoughts turned to his mother, his pain making him think of her tender ministrations when he was sick or hurt. Sturm's father had sent his wife and their son into exile because the boy, his only heir, was a target for those who would see the Knights of Salamnia banished forever from the face of Kryn. Sturm and his mother took refuge in solace. Sturm made friends readily, particularly with one other boy, Karaman, who shared his interest in all things military. But Sturm's proud mother considered the people beneath her, and so when the fever consumed her, she had died alone except for her teenage son. She had commended the boy to his father, if his father still lived, which Sturm was beginning to doubt. After his mother's death, the young man became a seasoned warrior under the guidance of Tannis and Flint, who adopted Sturm as they had unofficially adopted Karaman and Raislin. Together with ha Tasselhoff, the travel-loving Kender, and on occasion the twin's wild and beautiful half-sister Kitiara, Sturm and his friends escorted Flint on his journeys through the lands of Abanasnia, plying his trade as metalsmith. Five years ago, however, the companions decided to separate to investigate reports of evil growing in the land. They vowed to meet again at the inn of the last home. Sturm had traveled north to Salamnia, determined to find his father and his heritage. He found nothing and only narrowly escaped with his life and his father's sword and armor. The journey to his homeland was a harrowing experience. Sturm had known the knights were reviled, but he had been shocked to realize just how deep the bitterness against them ran. Huma, Lightbringer, Knight of Salamnia, had driven back the darkness years ago, during the Age of Dreams, and thus began the Age of Might. Then came the Cataclysm, when the gods abandoned man according to the popular belief. The people had turned to the knights for help, as they had turned to Huma in the past. But Huma was long dead. The knights could only watch helplessly as terror rained down from heaven and Kryn was smote asunder. The people had cried to the knights, but they could do nothing, and the people had never forgiven them. Standing in front of his family's ruined castle, Sturm vowed that he would restore the honor of the knights of Salamnia if it meant that he must sacrifice his life in the attempt. But how could he do that fighting a bunch of clerics, he wondered bitterly, the trail dimming before his eyes. He stumbled, caught himself quickly. Huma had fought dragons. Give me dragons, Sturm dreamed. He lifted his eyes. The leaves blurred into a golden mist, and he knew he was going to faint. Then he blinked. Everything came sharply into focus. Before him rose Prayer's Eye Peak. He and his companions had arrived at the foot of the old glacial mountain. He could see trails twisting and winding up the wooden slope. Trails used by Solace residents to reach picnic spots on the eastern side of the peak. Next to one of the well-worn paths stood a white stag. Sturm stared. The stag was the most magnificent animal the knight had ever seen. It was huge, standing several hands taller than any other stag the knight had hunted. It held its head proudly, its splendid rack gleaming like a crown. Its eyes were deep brown against its pure white fur, and it gazed at the knight intently as if it knew him. Then, with a slight shake of its head, the stag bounded away to the southwest. Stop! the knight called out hoarsely. The others whirled around in alarm, drawing weapons. Tennis came running back to him. What is it, Sturm? The knight involuntarily put his hand to his aching head. I'm sorry, Sturm, Tennis said. I didn't realize you were sick as this. We can rest. We're at the foot of Prayer's Eye Peak. I'm going to climb the mountain and see. No, look! The knight gripped Tannis' shoulder and turned him around. He pointed. See it? The white stag. The white stag? Tannis stared in the direction the knight indicated. Where? I don't... There, Sturm said softly. 
He took a few steps forward toward the animal who had stopped and seemed to be waiting for him. The stag nodded its great head. It darted away again just a few steps, then turned to face the knight once more. He wants us to follow him, Sturm gasps. Like Huma. The others had gathered around the knight now, regarding him with expressions that ranged from deeply concerned to obviously skeptical. I see no stag of any color, Riverwind said, his dark eyes scanning the forest. Head wound, Caraman nodded like a charlatan cleric. Come on, Sturm, lie down and rest while... You great blithering idiot, the knight snarled at Caraman. With your brains in your stomach, it is just as well you do not see the stag. You would probably shoot it and cook it. I tell you this, we must follow it. The madness of the head wound, Riverwind whispered to Tannis. I have seen it often. I'm not sure, Tannis said. He was silent for a few moments. When he spoke, it was with obvious reluctance. Though I have not seen the white stag myself, I have been with one who has, and I have followed it, like in the old man's story. His hand absently fingered the ring of twisting ivy leaves that he wore on his left hand, his thoughts with the golden-haired elf maiden who wept when he left Qualinesti. You're suggesting we follow an animal we can't even see, Caraman said, his jaw going slack. It would not be the strangest, strangest thing we have done, Raceland commented sarcastically in his whispering voice. Though remember it was the old man who told the tale of the white stag, and the old man who got us into this. It was our choice got us into this, Tannis snapped. We could have turned the staff over to the high theocrat and talked our way out of the predicament. We've talked our way out of worse. I say we follow Sturm. He has been chosen, apparently, just as Riverwind was chosen to receive the staff. But it's not even leading us in the right direction, Caraman argued. You know as well as I do that no trails through the western part of the woods. No one ever goes there. All the better, Goldmoon said suddenly. Tennis said those creatures might have the paths blocked. Maybe this is a way out. I say we follow the night. She turned and started off with Sturm, not even glancing back at the others, obviously accustomed to being obeyed. Riverwind shrugged and shook his head, scowling darkly, but he walked after Goldmoon and the others followed. The knight left the well-trodden path of Prayer's Eye Peak behind, moving in a southwesterly direction up the slope. At first it appeared Caraman was right, there were no trails. Sturm was crashing through the brush like a madman. Then suddenly a smooth, wide trail opened up ahead of them. Tannis stared at it in amazement. What or who cleared this trail, he asked Riverwind, who was also examining it with a puzzled expression. I don't know, the plainsman said. It's old. That felled tree has lain there long enough to sink over halfway into the dirt, and it's covered with moss and vines. But there's no tracks other than Sturm's. There's no sign of anyone or any animal passing through here. Yet why isn't it overgrown? Tannis couldn't answer, and he couldn't take time to think about it. Sturm forged ahead rapidly. All the party could do was try to keep him in sight. Goblins, boats, lizard men, invisible stags. What next? complained Flint to the kender. I wish I could see the stag, Taz said wistfully. Get hit on the head, the dwarf snorted. Although with you, we probably couldn't tell the difference. The companions followed Sturm, who was climbing with a wild kind of elation, his pain and wound forgotten. Tennis had difficulty catching up with the knight. When he did, he was alarmed at the feverish gleam in Sturm's eye, but the knight was obviously being guided by something. The trail led them up the slope to Prayer's Eye Peak. Tennis saw that it was taking them to the gap between the hands of stone, a gap that's as far as he knew no one had ever entered before. Wait a moment, he gasped, running to catch up with Sturm. It was nearly midday, he guessed, though the sun was still hidden by jagged gray clouds. Let's rest. I'm going to take a look at the land from over there. He pointed to a rock ledge that jutted out from the side of the peak. Rest, repeated Sturm vaguely, stopping and catching his breath. He stared ahead for a moment, then turned to Tannis. Yes, we'll rest. His eyes gleamed brightly. Are you all right? Fine, Sturm said absently and paced around the grass, gently stroking and smoothing his mustaches. Tannis looked at him a moment, irresolute, then went back to the others who were just coming over the crest of a small rise. We're going to rest here, the half-elf said. Raceland breathed a sigh of relief and sank down in the wet leaves. 
I'm going to have a look north, see what's moving back on the road to Haven, Tannis added. I'll come with you, Riverwind offered. Tannis nodded and the two left the path, heading for the rock ledge. Tannis glanced at the tall warrior as they walked together. He was beginning to feel comfortable with the stern, serious plainsman. A deeply private person himself, Riverwind respected the privacy of others and would never think of probing the boundaries Tannis set around his soul. This was as relaxing to the half-elf as the night's unbroken sleep. He knew that his friends, simply because they were his friends and had known him for years, were speculating on his relationship with Kitiara. Why had he chosen to break it off so abruptly five years ago? And why, then, his obvious disappointment when she failed to join them? Riverwind, of course, knew nothing about Kitiara, but Tannis had the feeling that if he did, he would be all the same to the plainsmen. It was Tannis's business, not his. When they were within sight of the Haven Road, they crawled the last few feet, inching their way along the wet rock until they came to the rim of the ledge. Tannis looked below to the east, could see the old picnic paths disappearing around the side of the mountain. Riverwind pointed, and Tannis realized there were creatures moving along the picnic trails. That explained the uncanny hush in the forest. Tannis pressed his lips together grimly. The creatures must be waiting to ambush them. Sturm and his white stag had probably saved their lives, but it wouldn't take the creatures long to find this new trail. Tannis glanced below him and blinked. There was no trail. There was nothing but thick, impenetrable forest. The trail had closed behind them. I must be imagining things, he thought, and he turned his eyes back to Haven Road and the many creatures moving along it. It hadn't taken them long to get organized, he thought. He gazed farther to the north and saw the still, peaceful waters of Crystalmere Lake. Then his glance traveled to the horizon. He frowned. There was something wrong. He couldn't place it immediately, so he said nothing to Riverwind but stared at the skyline. Storm clouds massed in the north were thickly, more thickly than ever, long gray fingers raking the land, and reaching up to meet them, that was it. Gripping Riverwind's arm, Tannis stabbed his finger northward. Riverwind looked, squinting, seeing nothing at first. Then he saw it, black smoke drifting into the sky, his thick, heavy brows contracted. Campfires, Tannis said. Many hundred campfires, Riverwind amended softly. The fires of war. That is an army encampment. So the rumors are confirmed, Sturm said when they returned. There is an army to the north. But what army? Whose? And why? What are they going to attack? Caraman laughed incredulously. No one would send an army after this staff, the warrior paused. Would they? The staff is but a part of this, Raceland hissed. Remember the fallen stars. Children's stories, Flint sniffed. He upended the empty wineskin, shook it, and sighed. My stories are not for children, Raceland said viciously, twisting up the leaves like a snake. And you would do well to heed my words, dwarf. There it is, there's the stag, Sturm said suddenly, his eyes staring straight at a large boulder, or so it seemed to his companions. It is time to go. The knight began walking. The others hastily gathered their gear together and hurried after him. As they climbed even farther up the trail, they seemed to materialize before them as they went. The wind switched and began blowing from the south. It was a warm breeze, carrying with it the, fracturate of the fragrance of late-blooming autumn wildflowers. It drove back the storm clouds, and just as they came to the cleft between the two halves of the peak... The sun broke free. It was well past midday when they stopped to rest for one more brief period before attempting to climb through the narrow gap between the walls of Prayer Eyed Peak through which Sturm said they must go. The stag had led the way, he insisted. It'll be supper time soon, Caraman said. He heaved a gusty sigh, staring at his feet. I could eat my boots. They're beginning to look good to me, too, Flint said grumpily. I wish the stag was flesh and blood. It might be useful for something besides getting us lost. Shut up, Sturm turned on the dwarf in a sudden rage, his fist clenched. Tannis rose quickly, put his hands on the knight's shoulder, holding him back. Sturm stood glaring at the dwarf, mustaches quivering. Then he jerked away from Tannis. Let's go, he muttered. 
As the companions entered the narrow defile, they could see clear blue sky on the other side. The south wind whistled across the steep white walls of the peak soaring above them. They walked carefully, small stones causing their feet to slip more than once. Fortunately, the way was so narrow that they could easily regain their balance by catching themselves against the steep walls. After about 30 minutes of walking, they came out the other side of Prayer's Eye Peak. They halted, staring down into a valley. Lush, grassy meadowland flowed in green waves below them to lap at the shores of a light green aspen forest far to the south. The storm clouds were behind them, and the sun shone brightly in a clear azure sky. For the first time, they found their cloaks too heavy, except for Raceland, who remained huddled in his red hooded cape. Flint had spent the morning complaining about the rain and now started in on the sunshine. It was too bright, glaring into his eyes. It was too hot, beating down on his helm. I say we throw the dwarf off the mountain, growled Caraman to Tannis. Tannis grinned. He'll rattle all the way down and give away our position. Who's down there to hear him? Caraman said, gesturing toward the valley with his broad hand. I bet we're the first living beings to set eyes on this valley. First living beings, Raceland breathed. You are right there, my brother, for you look on darkened wood. No one spoke. Riverwind shifted uncomfortably. Goldmoon crept over to stand beside him, staring down into the green trees, her eyes wide. Flint cleared his throat and fell silent, stroking his long beard. Sturm regarded the forest calmly. So did Tasselhoff. It doesn't look bad at all, the kender said cheerfully. Sitting cross-legged on the ground, a sheaf of parchment spread out on his knees, he was drawing the map with a bit of charcoal, attempting to trace their way up Prayer's Eye Peak. Looks are as deceptive as light-fingered kender, Raceland whispered harshly. Tasselhoff frowned, started to retort, then caught Tannis' eye and went back to his drawing. Tannis walked over to Sturm. The knight stood out on a ledge, the south wind blowing back his long hair and whipping his frayed cape about him. Sturm, where is the stag? Do you see it now? Yes, Sturm answered. He pointed downward. It walked across the meadow. I can see its trail in the tall grass. It has gone into the aspens there. Gone into darkened wood, Tannis murmured. Who says that is darkened wood? Sturm turned his face to Tannis. Raceland. Ah! He is magi, Tannis said. He is crazed, Sturm replied. Then he shrugged. But stay here rooted on the side of the peak if you like, Tannis. I will follow the stag, as did Huma, even if it leads me into darkened wood. Wrapping his cloak around him, Sturm climbed down the ledge and began to walk along a winding trail that led down the mountainside. Tennis returned to the others, the stags leading him on a straight path right into the forest, he said. How certain are you that this forest is dark and wood, Raceland? How certain is one of anything, half-elven, the mage replied. I am not certain of drawing my next breath. But go ahead, walk into the wood that no living man has ever walked out of. Death is life's one great certainty, Tannis. The half-elf felt a sudden urge to throw Raceland off the side of the mountain. He stared after Sturm, who was nearly halfway down into the valley. I'm going with Sturm, he said suddenly, but I'll be responsible for no one else in this decision. The rest of you may follow as you choose. I'm coming, Tasselhoff rolled his map up and slipped it into his scroll case. He scrambled to his feet, sliding in the loose rocks. Ghosts, Flint scowled at Raceland, snapping his fingers derisively, then stumped over to stand beside the half-elf. Goldmoon followed unhesitatingly, though her face was pale. Riverwind joined the group more slowly, his face thoughtful. Tannis was relieved. The barbarians had many frightened legends of dark and wood, he knew. And finally, Raceland moved forward so rapidly he took his brother completely by surprise. Tannis regarded the mage with a slight smile. Why do you come? He couldn't help asking. Because you will need me, half-elven, the mage hissed. Besides, where would you have us go? You have allowed us to be led this far. There can be no turning back. It is the ogre's choice you offer us, Tannis. Die fast or die slow. He set off down the side of the peak. Coming, brother? The others glanced uneasily at Tannis as the brothers passed. The half-elf felt like a fool. 
Raislin was right, of course. He'd let this go far beyond his control, then made it seem as if it were their decision, not his, allowing him to go forward with a clear conscience. Angrily, he picked up a rock and hurled it far down the mountainside. Why was it his responsibility in the first place? Why had he gotten involved when all he had wanted was to find Kitiara and tell her his mind was made up? He loved her and wanted her. He could accept her human frailties as he had learned to accept his own. But Kit hadn't come back to him. She had a new lord. Maybe that's why he'd... Ho, Tannis! The Kender's voice floated up to him. I'm coming, he muttered. The sun was just beginning to dip into the west when the companions reached the edge of the forest. Tannis figured they had at least three or four hours of daylight left. If the stag continued to lead them on smooth, clear trails, they might be able to get through this forest before darkness fell. Sturm waited for them beneath the aspens, resting comfortably in the leafy green shade. The companions left the meadow slowly, none of them in any hurry to enter the woods. The stag entered here, Sturm said, rising to his feet and pointing into the tall grass. Tannis saw no tracks. He took a drink of water from his nearly empty water skin and stared into the forest. As Tasseloff had said, the wood did not seem sinister. In fact, it looked cool and inviting after the harsh brilliance of the autumn sunshine. Maybe there'll be some game in here, Caraman said, rocking back on his heels. Not stags, of course, he added hastily. Rabbits, maybe. Shoot nothing, eat nothing, drink nothing in darkened wood, Raislin whispered. Tannis looked at the mage, whose hourglass eyes were dilated. The metallic skin shone a ghastly color in the strong sunlight. Raislin leaned upon his staff, shivering as if from a chill. Children's stories, Flint muttered, but the dwarf's voice lacked conviction. Although Tannis knew Raislin's flair for the dramatic, he had never seen the mage affected like this before. "'What do you sense, Raislin?' he asked quietly. "'There is a great and powerful magic laid on this wood,' whispered Raislin. "'Evil?' asked Tannis. "'Only to those who bring evil in with them,' the mage stated. "'Then you are the only one who need fear this forest,' Sturm told the mage coldly. Kerman's face flushed an ugly red, his hand fumbled for his sword. Sturm's hand went to his blade. Tannis gripped Sturm's arm as Raislin touched his brother. The mage stared at the knight, his golden eyes glimmering. We shall see, Raislin said. The words, nothing more than hissing sounds, clicking between his teeth. We shall see. Then leaning heavily upon his staff, Raislin turned to his brother. Coming? Kerman glared angrily at Sturm, then entered the wood, walking beside his twin. The others moved after them, leaving only Tannis and Flint standing in the long, wavering grass. "'I'm getting too old for this, Tannis,' the dwarf said suddenly. "'Nonsense,' the half-elf replied, smiling. "'You fought like a—' "'No, I don't mean the bones or the muscles,' the dwarf looked at his gnarled hands. "'Though they're old enough. I mean the spirit.' Years ago, before the others were born, you and I were would have walked into a wicked wood without giving it a second thought. Now... Cheer up, Tannis said. He tried the sound light, though he had deeply disturbed by the dwarves' unusual somberness. He studied Flint closely for the first time since meeting outside Solace. The dwarf looked old, but then Flint had always looked old. His face, what could be seen through the mass of gray beard and mustaches and overhanging white eyebrows, was brown and wrinkled and cracked like old leather. The dwarf grumbled and complained, but then Flint had always grumbled and complained. The change was in his eyes. The fiery luster was gone. Don't let Raceland get to you, Tannis said. We'll sit around the fire tonight and laugh at his ghost stories. I suppose so, Flint sighed. He was silent a moment, then said, Someday I'll slow you up, Tannis. I don't ever want you to think, Why do I put up with this grumbling old dwarf? Because I need you, grumbling old dwarf, Tannis said, putting his hand on the dwarf's heavy set shoulder. He motioned into the wood after the others. I need you, Flint. They're all so... so young. You're like a solid rock that I can set my back against as I wield my sword. Flint's face flushed in pleasure. He tugged at his beard, then cleared his throat gruffly. Yes, well, you were always sentimental. 
Come along, we're wasting time. I want to get through this confounded forest as fast as possible. Then he muttered, just glad it's daylight.